Hey guys, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> my voice is trashed, <clears throat> and I am rather wore out. It's been a rough week. It's been a productive week, but it's been a rough week. So let's see if we can get any more people in here. I'll hold off just for a few moments. And in the interim, I want to take a look at the DNAC. Let me go ahead and expand this out. And I want to go to provision, to fabric, to fabric one, pod one. All right, so everything's free. Hey, last time it was just me and Adi. Got kind of got kind of lonely up in here. <laughs> but some of us have decided it's time to start thinking about the CCIE ex exam again. Some of us never stopped thinking about it. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get kicked off, and I want to kind of talk about what I want to do tonight. And I'm going to go ahead and kill my video just to get it off the screen. What I want is I want to first explore the lab environment that I have here, which is my DNA center. And we'll talk about labs and we're going to talk about some other things because uh, I am teaching a enterprise uh, SD WAN class next week. And I'm, t I'm going to be teaching the. Um, Narbex CCIE Enterprise Weekend class. I'm actually going to be teaching four Saturdays of that where I'm going to be covering SD WAN, SDA, and automation. So I'm um, trying to get all of the kinks worked out. So some of you guys may or may not have seen this lab guide. This is the lab guide that I am working on right now. Um, I have as of today i finished lab seven which is task three which completes the sda component for this phase of the class and i'm going back to the sd wan to cover the integration of iot uh, a vpn for iot a vpn for let me fix my chair a vpn for iot and a vpn for guest and as soon as that's done, I will be adding the policy sections to the lab guide. Uh, I have been running a couple of guys in sessions to just help me get things tested out. And what I want to do today, as I promised, that I would spend some time talking about SGTs and SGACLs because we kind of skirt over them a lot of times in the classes that I'm teaching. And one of those big issues for me has been uh, getting a connectivity of hosts. And I have uh, so far found a way to make that work. Uh, and I'm um, going to kind of take you guys with me on an exploration. Hey, Angel, as we go through this. So what I wanted to illustrate, first of all, was I'm going to go to policy. And I'm going to go to my virtual networks. And what I want to do, since we're going to be talking today, at least in the latter part of the day or this evening, we're going to be talking about the concept of SGT, scalable group tags. In other words, micro segmentation. Now, we all should know that inside of DNA Center, we use a virtual network to represent a macro segmentation construct, which is a one-to-one -one analogy to a virtual routing and forwarding unit. It's also important to note that a VRF and a VN and a VPN in the context of SD-WAN is the same thing. Now, if we go down and take a look at my pod, the one I'm using for demonstration today is pods. It's going to be pod one. And I have created a virtual network of corporate. And what I've done is I have drug the contractors and the employees, SGT into my virtual network. Now, I could drag others. I'm just choosing to focus on these and try to keep everything boiled down to you know bare minimum components. Now, what I wanted to do this evening is I wanted to kill a couple of birds with one stone. One of those is going to be the principle of onboarding. And we have you guys have seen me conduct onboarding in, in a number of ways. So as an example, if I go to my discovery um, section of the DNA Center, and from there, I go to view all of my discoveries. You can see here, I've got students that are labbing in the background. 
Um, but here is my pod one discovery where I discovered all of my devices. And I also have a pod one seed, which is a where I have discovered my border. And then what I'm going to do is I want to do a land automation. And I want to do that in class because I want to go through this from the perspective of how easy it is to actually implement it. Because a lot of times I skirt around it. Now, if we take a look inside of the provisioning section and I look in unassigned, we'll see that there are no unassigned devices. And if I go to my floor, there are no devices inside of not my floor, but my building in this instance. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to remedy that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the discovery process. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to rerun the discovery of seed because I want to use this device to discover the um, edge device. So I'm going to rediscover this resource and hopefully it should go in, go and actually find it. So you can see here that it's gone into the, the queued stasis status. And then ultimately it should go all the way through all of the different states of in progress. And then it should transition into complete if all goes well. And when it completes, there should be a device that shows up here in the listing that shows that it is of status green, ICMP green, SNMP green, CLI green, which means the system can actually SSH to it. And you'll notice that NetConf is gray because I'm not employing that in the lab at this time. In uh, Unless you're ever instructed to do NetConf uh, in the lab, if they tell you to do it, obviously use it. You'd probably use the, the port 830, uh, which is the default port. Uh, but in the real world, the only time that you really absolutely positively need to use NetConf is when you're going to be working with wireless environments and wireless is not part of our blueprint. So what I want to do is I want to take this device. I want to look at this device. I'm going to go back into the DNA center and I want to return to my inventory tab under provisioning. And what we're going to see here is, is that ultimately this device should show up in the listing. Now, typically what I try to do is I try to make certain that it shows up as managed as its last state. And the reason that I do that is I want to make certain that the DNAC has absolute control over the resource. The other thing that I also typically do is I scroll to the right and I try to make certain that I have no partial collection error messages. Partial collection error messages can cause problems uh, for us. And typically it means either the process started, it was working successfully, and then something went wrong or maybe it timed out, there are any number of values or factors that can actually cause these resources to fail to appear. Now, I've got this guy. What I'm going to do now is uh, I'm just simply going to click on it, and I'm going to tell the system that I actually want to, pr to provision this device, and I'm going to provision it in my pod, which is pod one, and when I hit next, it's going to go through. It's going to give me the, the menu options. But ultimately, I just want to deploy this guy so that I can get it to disappear out of the unassigned section. And it should appear on my floor. And then ultimately, I want it to appear in the fabric that pre-exists. Now, in the enterprise infrastructure exam for CCIE, your fabric will already exist, your blueprint site specifically that you are going to be required to add a device to an existing fabric. And we can see here that I have a number of fabrics in here that other students are using. I have mine, which is P1 fabric. And when I click on pod one, we can see that I now have a border node. Now this border node, uh, this is an FIAB. I could make this a, um, an, uh, uh, this is a 9300. I can make it an FIAB. It could be an edge. It could be a control plane. It could be a border all in one box. We, we've gone through that in class. What I want to do is I actually want to make a larger infrastructure where I have a border and an edge. And I'm going to have the border be the border and the control plane node. And the edge node is going to ultimately end up being exactly that, an edge node. But right now, I don't have one. And what I want to do is I want to remedy that. And rather than doing a discovery, what I want to do is I am going to go back to devices and inventory. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight this guy. I'm going to go to actions. And I'm going to go to provision. And we have a feature here called now, there are a number of prerequisites that are going to be necessary for me to conduct the LAN automation. First of all, I have to have a LAN automation pool. In my lab, for my pod, that's going to be 100.1, my pod number, .105.0/24. And what the DNA center is going to do is it's going to carve that address range up into a several slash 30s, and it's going to assign those to the devices 
that the system discovers during this process called land automation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and click on land automation, and I'm going to answer the questions posed or put to me by the wizard. So my primary site is going to end up being pod one. My primary device is going to be the device, the only device in pod one, which is my border. And I'm going to use, um, let me double check and make sure I use the right uh, address. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, interface should be 12 in this instance. I just want to make certain. There are a couple of devices that have some wiring differences I need to fix tomorrow. I found that out today. So, um, I'm going to go to 9K1. And let's show CDP neighbors, and it should be gigabit Ethernet 11. So it is, it's 11, not 12. It's 12 on pod 16. So I, I, I knew I had it mixed up. So I need to use 11. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back into config here and I'm going to say use gigabit Ethernet 11. Now, what this is telling the DNAC is I want you to start, Mr. DNAC, to take control of this border node. And I want you, what I want you to do is I want you to start sending discovery messages, CDP, LLDP, whatever the options are. By default, it will be CDP. In this configuration, I want you to start discovering devices that are going to be connected to me outside of this interface. So as a direct result of that, what's going to end up happening is as devices that I'm going to find, I am going to go ahead and tell them they're part of my building. So whatever I discover, I want you to place those resources in pod one. And I need to specify that pool, and that pool is that 100 dot pod number, in my case, dot one. 105.0 slash 24 address range, which is of a type of IP pool called a LAN IP pool. 99.9% .9 of the stuff that we do in the enterprise infrastructure exam will all involve, will all involve uh, generic IP pools. Now, am I saying that you guys are going to get called upon in the lab to do LAN automation? I don't think so, but it's always good to know how. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and specify an ISIS password of Cisco 123. So that's going to be capital C-I-S-C-O 123. And I'm going to enable multicast in the underlay for the purposes of alleviating issues associated with the possibility of silent hosts and also any of my non-directable, non-control plane directable multi-destination traffic. So as a result of this, what I'm really doing is I'm telling the DNAC, not only go out and find that the, any devices that exist outside of gigabit 1011, I'm telling it to add them to the inventory. I'm telling it to go ahead and assign them to my building. And I'm telling it to go ahead and assign them IP addresses, run routing protocols, issue IP addresses out of the ranges that I'm specifying here, the ones that are in that P1 LAN auto pool. And what I want to do now is I'm going to go ahead and start this process. All right. So um, I need to do a little house cleaning on this guy before I can do that. So sorry about that. Uh, I checked everything to make sure everything would work. And what I probably have done is left him on show. Uh, so IP interface brief, E assigned addresses. Yeah, I got all kinds of stuff in here. So I uh, need to say no, no interface. Oop. Back 6,000. No interface. Oh. Zero. So I, I need to get rid of PIM, too. I don't even know what, you, what it used for the RP. I'm going to have to, uh, I'm, I, I'm either going to have to blow this out or I'm just going to have to go through with a fine tooth comb and pull out stuff. So let me just double check this real quick. 
wouldn't be one of my lives if it didn't have a problem. So new model. That all may have to go. Triple A radius. All of this stayed. Well, I discovered it, so I will still, ha I'll have to rediscover it anyway, so looking for, <laughs> so it looks like PIM only got install installed on the loop back in the main interfaces. Hmm. I conclude. Okay. So, get rid of that. So, on our show, the um, interface, but on the loopback. So, config t, loopback zero, no, you can. No interface back thousand. That one was gone to show IP show IP interface brief. He assigned addresses. If this doesn't clean it all out, so the tunnels are now gone because PIM's gone. So if this doesn't clean it all out, then what I'll end up doing is I will um, go ahead and remove this and then I will um, uh, blow it out and then redo it. But right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to resync the device because I made a configurational change and the DNAC needs to become aware of that. Sorry about that, guys. I was trying to make certain that nothing went south and something went south. <clears throat> so primarily I'm just waiting for it to do its thing. And while that's happening, I'm just going to go ahead and go into the land automation one more time. And let me see if I can finish the rest of the config while I'm waiting. So we said it was 11, correct? Micronics Corporation Pod 1. P1 land automation, ISIS. It was by enabling the multicast that I caused myself problems. Let's go ahead and see if it'll let me do it now. Override of primary seed, ISIS, domain password is not allowed. So uh, let me double check that. What did I use? I thought it was Cisco123. Let me double check it. To show run pipe section. This, um, this oh, typo. Now, let's see if it goes. I'm trying to change what's already on the device, and the system won't allow me to do that. So that, that was the problem. So the seed device is where I'm going to start my configuration. And from the seed device, typically, I do not or cannot or will not attempt to make changes. Now, I wait maybe you know a minute, a minute and a half. And then what I do is I go up to my actions and I go back to provision. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to land automation status. And from the land automation status, we can see here that the process is, is initialized. And you can go to the logs and you can actually see the process by which the device is um, deploying 
phases of this implementation and you know these things that will add devices everything should go through i've done this like three times today so i got um need to let's go ahead and take a look at what's going on on this device so right now if i were to say show ip dhcp or let's do a show run section dhcp and what we can see here is it has added an IP DHCP range that it's trying to use, and this address range will be issued, show IP DHCP binding, to devices that are going to be connecting to this resource via our configuration. You can see here it's going out all over Hell's Half Acre here as far as IP addresses that are being issued out to VLAN one for various and sundry reasons so let's see what happens if i refresh here and as you can see here it says reserved an ip address of 66 it's reserved ip addresses for 66 67 for inter for devices that it found out of 1011 now what's happening here is is that ip addresses are being issued one will be issued to a loopback address one will be issued for the purposes of making reference to the device itself. You can see here it's actually translating that name. <coughs> the switch name is actually gonna be derived from the IP address issued by the DNA center. We can see that the device has been claimed. If I hit refresh again, we can see now that we're sitting in claim, and if I go back to summary, we are sitting in what is referred to as the in progress state. Now, this ultimately should allow me to be able to identify and find this box, this device that's sitting out there with this serial number. And what we're doing is we're in the process of claiming it from the plug and play database inside of the DNA Center. Land Automation takes care of this entire process for us. And then ultimately what will end up happening is, is the device will end up being claimed and it's going to get its configurational name and everything pushed by the DNA Center. And then ultimately it's going to become added to our inventory. So we're, we're fundamentally just waiting for that process to take place. When that happens, this will actually move from a progress of one to a one completed. And again, bear in mind, there are other devices out there that the DNA center sees, but they are not currently in their factory re reset state. Typically, I go to a device and I type PNPA space service space reset and then hit enter, and that just basically eradicates the entire running configuration of the device and restores the device to its normal operational state, AKA its factory state. And then from there, you can discover it using plug and play, using the DNA center, and you can add the resources to your infrastructure, uh, receive ZTP device provision provisioning message. The next message that I should receive is gonna tell me that it has been added to my inventory. So once again, we're just simply waiting for that process to take place. These edges are 3650s. Um, and as a direct result of them being 3650s, they're not exactly the fastest things in the world. So just need to be patient and wait for it. So we'll go for the logs here, refresh. Added the device to the inventory. Summary should tell me that I am completed. Now, if I had 20 devices out there, I would want to wait until all 20 of those devices were discovered via this process. Land automated via this process is a better way to say that. However, right now, what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead, and since I know that's the only device that I'm going to be configuring, let's take a look at it. So what I'm going to find here is if I say show ISIS neighbors, I should have a neighbor adjacency. It is going to be a level two adjacency based on the way that I built my seed configuration. And if I were to go to that device, let's go ahead and say I want to go to edge one, and we take a look at what's going on, it's going to have all of the configuration. Net admin, ICE is cool. It's going to have that unique name, ICE is cool, based on the IP address that was issued. And if I take a look at what's going on here and I say show IP interface brief, exclude assigned addresses and we take a look at what's going on you can see here that vlan one has an ip address issued out of the 105 loopback zero has one issued out of 105 and tunnel zero has one issued out of, out of 105 which is 68 now that tunnel zero is a result of ip pim being configured on this switch by the dna center and again 
when I started this process, this switch was just sitting here, sitting in the the Express Installation Wizard uh, after a PNPA space service space reset command issued on that device. So it was just waiting for somebody to reach out and engage in this concept of the plug and play service. We're not done yet, though, because the problem that I have here is, is that my neighbor adjacencies. So if I say show ISIS neighbors, we take a look at that. What we're seeing here is, is that the ISIS adjacency is coming from the interface that is going to be, in this case, the VLAN zero interface. So if I say show uh, CLNS um, interface, bear with me, guys. It's been forever since I've played around with. There's no brief version of this, but you can see here that this guy right here, this interface, which is VLAN 1, is up and operational, and it is participating in ISIS. Intermediate system to intermediate system. Now, um, we'll see no other interface is participating at this particular point except for the loopback address, which is going to end up being the norm. So as a result of what's happening here, I'm not in a ready state. What I really want to do is I want to have gigabit interface 1011. So show run interface gigabit 1011. I want this interface to have a native routed IP on it. And I want to have my loopback have its IP address assigned. And I don't want to be running this concept of VLAN 1 as an interface. Now, to, to correct that, what I, all I got to do is come over here and say stop. Now, once I've stopped this process, the DNAC says, okay, we've discovered all of these devices. And what we want to do is we want to transition away from the concept of using the loopback interface, or I'm sorry, the VLAN interface, VLAN 1 in this instance. We want to move away from using that for the origination of these ISIS adjacencies. What we're going to want to do is we're going to go ahead and transition from this to where we're going to start using those physical interfaces. Now, I'm going to give this some time to stop. I don't like being in the console when I'm doing this, especially in this version of the DNA Center, because sometimes it seems that if I'm typing, it causes some kind of um, interruption or a hiccup in the road, and sometimes this just doesn't uh, take place. But we can see here, success, stop network orchestration was successful. And as a result of that, it is now completed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and close. I'm going to go back into this device. And now if I say show run interface gigabit 1011, what we're going to see here is, is this, the DNAC configured it with the IP address that is going to ultimately end up being used to form this adjacency. And if I do show ISIS neighbors, I have my neighbor relationship, but I'm now forming it out of gigabit 1011. And the switch name of 100.1.105.68 is actually the IP address. Show run interface loopback zero. We can see here that this is the IP address that is assigned to it. So this is this is ultimately its naming resource. The other thing that we also want to know is so if I come over here and say show uh, system MTU. In this case, I want it to verify that my MTU is 9100 bytes. Now I sat that manually, and then I blew the device, and then I handled the install. And on the order node, it should be the exact same thing. I know it is because I have an ISIS adjacency. Show system MTU. If these did not match, I would not be able to get an adjacency between the edge and the border as a result of the MTU mismatch, which is not fixable like in OSPF. You could do an IP OSPF MTU ignore, which I highly recommend you never do in production, but you can do it in ISIS. We don't have that option. Now, as a result of what's happening here, this device, if I go ahead and hit refresh, it should appear in the list with its given name. Now, I could change the name of this device. I could use a template to do that. I got a number of different options, and we can talk about those in subsequent sessions. But what I want to do right now is I want to go through the provisioning component of this. So right now, the problem that I have is this switch has been 
added to the inventory. It has been assigned to my pod, but it is not, no matter what we read in the land automation subsection, it has not been provisioned. Let me illustrate that point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to fabric. I'm going to go to pod one fabric, and I now should see devices in pod one. We see here that I see the switch, which is going to be the edge, and I have my border node. If I click on my border node, which is provisioned, I can choose role states or operational behaviors, edge, border, control plane, guest control plane, border, anchor, um, whatever. But if I click on this guy, it says needs to be provisioned to be added to the fabric. So we're going to take care of that. Lickety split by going back over to inventory. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on him. I'm going to go to actions, provision. I'm going to go ahead and provision the device. And since it has already been assigned by the automation process, all I've got to do is just answer yes to the wizard. We don't have any specialized templates, so that second uh, screen gets skipped. And then ultimately what we're going to do is we're going to deploy this guy and just simply wait for it to finish. Now, I'm, I can observe it here, but I typically like to go to the fabric itself and just check and see what's going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait. You notice this guy's gray. This guy's clear. Well, this guy's provision. So when I click on him, I have options. When I click on this guy, I don't have options. And hopefully by the time I get the border node configured, the edge node will be ready. So as a result of this, I want to make this my control plane node. And I also want to make it my border node. Now, as a result of this, I'm going to need to give it an autonomous system. I'm going to use 6501 since I'm prod one. And I'm going to pick my layer three handoff pool to carve off slash 30s again to use to communicate to my fusion node. And in our lab, that fusion node is a edge. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make this default to all virtual networks. And I am going to go ahead and say, do not import external routes. So this is going to be an external border router at this point, or what we used to refer to as an unknown border. So as a result of this, I'm going to pick my transit network, which I created ahead of time, which is just uh, P1 transit, which is making reference to the autonomous system 65101, which is going to be the BGP ASN that my device is going to be connected to, which just so happens in our lab to be running on a V-Edge. I'm going to go ahead and say add. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to select my interface, and I'm going to select the virtual networks that I want to enable on that interface. My interface is going to be giving me Ethernet 02, 102, 102. There we go. And the virtual networks I'm going to pick are going to be default infra, pod one corporate, and pod one guest. And I'm going to go ahead and hit save. Now I'm going to go ahead and say add. Let's go ahead and see if this guy has done his thing. If I refreshed, he would turn um, probably clear, but I don't want to screw up what I've got on my CB. So now all I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I want you to be a border node or an edge node, excuse me. So we'll go ahead and say apply. And ultimately, this should kick configuration to these devices that we're going to be using to um, test out the creation of a fabric. Now, while that's going on, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and because I have not gotten my Bitnami um, EMs installed, I'm just going to go ahead and use my vSphere client, and I'm going to log in to it. And I'm going to open up two sessions to two Ubuntu machines. So you'll notice right here on this server, I'll go ahead and just shrink these. But on server 141, I have pod one, host one, pod one, host two, pod two, host one, et cetera, et cetera. I'm building this all out. I just figured this out this evening as a, as a way to uh, be able to set up the independent hosts. I just have not had time to install the... Um, guacamole engine so I, I will be running um bitnami um vms so that students can just go to they'll open a browser to that host and then they'll be able to get to these machines without having to do something like this and i didn't want to rely on um, vnc i hate vnc uh, so i wanted something a little bit easier to use well it is still vnc but it's going to end up being a plugin so i have these two hosts 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to log into these SDA rocks one two three. What we'll find here is on host one and pod one, if I say IP address, we see that I have an IP address of 100.1.101.101. And on this guy right here, I should have an IP address of 102. They're both inside of the same virtual network. They're both part of corporate. Now, first, what I want to talk about since they're both going to be part of corporate, that means they're going to have the same network, but they're going to be connected to two independent interfaces. Host one is connected to gigabit 101 on edge, and gig, uh, the uh, second host is going to be connected to gigabit 102 on the same edge. Now let's look at that. So what I want to do at this juncture is I want to also show, if I come over here and say um, IP route, we should see that I have a static default route of 100.1.101.1. And that's for both of those. And that address right now does not exist. So if I come over here and say ping 1.101.1, I have no IP reachability to that gateway of last resort because it doesn't exist. Now let's entertain that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get into edge one and I'm gonna say show IP interface brief, exclude assigned addresses. And we'll notice here that I do have that 100.1.101.1. It does exist, but I can't ping it. But what I want you to note here is the protocol is down. And that's because we have not assigned or onboarded any of our wired hosts into our infrastructure. This is a line item directly out of your blueprint, onboarding wired hosts. So let's do that. So what I'm going to do now, hopefully uh, it's had time to finish. I want to go over here. I'm going to click on this guy. I'm going to go to details. I'm going to scroll down and I want to see success, not configuring. So as a result of that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the host onboarding subsection. Now, you would have to select an authentication method. I have already in subsequent demonstrations, uh, I think in, I, did, I did a live on Tuesday for some, for some, uh, some CCIE students. Um, I have configured uh, the pod one VN of corporate and the pod one VN of guest. And inside of each of these are those addresses and you can see here 100.1.101.0 slash 24 that's the network that i'm using and that is the network that i need to make active now making that network active means i need to take resources that are part of my infrastructure and connect them to these networks so what i'm going to do here is i'm going to come over here and i'm going to select gigabit ethernet and i'm going to scroll up gigabit ethernet one and what i'm going to do is i'm going to assign characteristics to this i'm going to go to the make it a user device it's an ip phone a computer or a laptop i'm going to tell it what pool it's participating in and i am going to go ahead and add a group of employees what i'm going to do next is i'm going to go to my authentication template and i'm just going to say i don't want one and i'm going to go ahead and update that so this configuration will be pushed to that interface by the dnac when i tell it to next thing i'm going to do is i'm going to come over here and i'm going to place this interface in the exact same virtual network but so that we can talk about the idea of micro segmentation, I'm going to take the macro segmented group of 100.1.101.0/24, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to micro segment it using an SGT tag. The difference between contractors and employees. I'm also going to override my authentication. I'm still working on getting that to work on the sub thing. So before I do anything right now, let's take a look at these interfaces. I'm going to say show run interface gigabit 101 and 102. There's no config. And remember, show IP or show IP interface brief exclude assigned addresses. We still see here that both of my VNs, VN 1021, which corresponds to campus, I can show you that show run 
interface, VLAN 1, 021. We can see that it is part of the virtual forwarding instance of Pod 1 Corp, so the corporate virtual network. Now, it becomes really important for us to pay attention to what happens next because the second that I get everything configured the way I want it, this interface right here should go up, up. Now, the reason that the VLAN 1022 is not going to go up, up is the fact that I do not currently have an interface in Guest at this time. And I'm not going to do one of those tonight. So what I want to do now is I'm going to go ahead and come over here and I'm going to say, I want to save these configurations and apply them. The DNAC is going to log into the appropriate devices and it's going to make the appropriate configurational changes. As a direct result of that, these interfaces should get their config. We should see the SGTs assigned. This is static assignment. Other ways that I could issue SGTs would be based on MAB, MAB, which is going to be for wireless infrastructure, and or I could use 802.1x supplicant clients for both wired or and wireless. So right now, I'm just taking the coward's way out. I will be doing labs in the lab guide for the different versions, except for MAB, since wireless is not on our infrastructure, on our blueprint. So this seems to have some time to go through. Let's take a look and see what happens now. Show run interface, gigabit 101. We can see that we have the SGT4. Four is going to be employee, five will be guest. You can see that inside of the, um, the uh, DNA center when you build them. Typically I have students specify them. I'm just using the defaults. If I take a look at gigabit two, what we're going to see here is, is that we have SGT5, like I said, and we can see that they're both part of the same access VLAN, 1021. And when I do a show IP interface brief exclude assigned addresses, we can see that it went up, up. As I said, and, and as I told everyone, 1022 would not enter an up, up operational state. Now, that begs the question. What's going on with my pings? Are my pings working? Well, my ping, you, we can see here plain as day, my ping is actually doing everything it's supposed to be doing. Let's take a look at this. Um, I, I log in SDA rocks one, two, three. What I want to do now is I'm actually going to ping the same gateway. And what I also want to do is from P1 host two, let's see if we can ping the IP address on P1 host one, which is 101. And we can see here that I have reachability. Now let's look at this and make certain some magic didn't happen here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say IP neighbor. I want to look at the, the ARP table. So IP neighbors, we can see here, I pinged uh, 100.1.101.101 .101 out of the interface of ENS160, and it had this MAC address. So 0090. So let's come over here and let's go ahead and stop this ping. And let's say, uh, we'll say IP address. And let's look at that MAC address. That MAC address is 0090. So that's the right MAC address that we're actually resolving. And this device, ping 100.1.101.102, should have reachability to its neighbor here. So right now, if I were to create a situation where we've got reciprocal pinging going on, everything's working the way we would anticipate it to work. And this stands to reason because these devices are part of the same virtual network. They're also attached to the same switch. Now, what if I wanted to stop this behavior? Because what we've seen here is, is that if I had a third device and that third device was in a separate virtual network, AKA guest, that guest would not be able right now because we haven't done any type of configuration to allow it, that that host inside of guest would be able to ping resources inside of guest, but not resources inside of camp or corporate. Now, right now, I've got two hosts that are in corporate, but I went ahead and assigned them different SGTs. And students ask me all the time, well, if you're assigning a scalable group tag, I thought you wanted to use those scalable group tags to prevent communication from taking place. And the answer to that question is, is that is exactly what we intended, but the default behavior of the DNA center is not one of no trust. So if I go into policy right now 
And from policy, we take a look at our grid. We can see here that I have a field value where I have employees and I have contractors and I have contractors and I have employees. The left column is the data sourced from a resource. The right, the top bar or the top row is going to be the, where the traffic is going to be desk. And if we take a look at that, notice my, my default behavior is permit IP. So what this actually says is, is that by default, micro segmentation does not immediately take effect inside of the DNA center. So let's fix that. Let's go ahead and change the rules. So I'm going to go to employees and I'm going to go all the way to contractors. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the contract and I want to just take a static deny IP. This is a scalable group access control list, sometimes a security group access control list, depending on how old your books, the books are that you've been reading. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and change this and I'm going to hit save and I'm going to pat myself on the back because I'm going to get a little red square right here that's going to be indicative of the fact that I have blocked communication coming from employees going towards contractors and vice versa by blocking this. I've actually blocked uh, blocked reciprocal traffic, so it should break things. But when we get into the P1 host, we're going to find here that it doesn't seem like I've really broken anything. And this is single-handedly one of the biggest and most common things that I run into, little stupid mistakes that I make, and that is, is forgetting to deploy my intent. Right now, I have my employees and my contractors, and if I go up and then I hit deploy, this is actually going to communicate that information to the D to the identity services engine. And as a result of sending it to the identity services engine, it should break my pings. This is indicative of simple, straightforward SGT micro segmentation using SGACLs from the perspective of the DNA center. Now, in the lab, you will not call, be called upon to create SGTs inside of the ICE engine. In the lab, you will not be called upon to create SGTs in the Identity Services engine. You could be called upon to create SGTs from the DNAC as well as creating your SGACLs. So if I go back into the DNA Center and from the perspective of the DNA Center, I click on my contract and I say, set back to the default it's going to delete the properties immediately everybody has a tendency to want to hop over here and start looking at the successful pings and patting themselves on the back but again it doesn't do deck squat until you deploy once you have those deployed we should immediately start seeing our pings cycle back so guys this is basically in the context of the lab, the length and the breadth of SGT access control lists. Now, if we were to take a look inside of the ICE, so if I log into 100.64.0.241, and we say admin, ICE is cool, and I log in, I just want to look around a little bit because what we're going to see is, first of all, on the main page, we should see a number of network devices that have, quote unquote, been discovered. And in fact, if I were to go to administration, and go to network devices, I'm going to see that I have a detailed list of these resources. I also have the concept inside of the configuration of what we call uh, under work centers. If I go to work centers, I want to go to components. And under components what we're going to see here is, is these are the sgts we simply use two default sgts employees and contractors normally i have in class i have students create a uh, employee so pod one employee uh, pod one uh, contractor so that they can create their own uh, sgacls but a lot of people get confused and think that that's absolutely necessary and it's not and if we go in and we start taking a look at the rest of the things in here, understanding how to manipulate things inside of the identity services engine is useful, but it's not really going to have a direct impact on your ability to be able to navigate the lab. I've covered sections in the 
UI for the uh, identity services engine that I feel are important and they revolve and always will integrate with authentication. So for the most part, that's going to be under identities. They could, you could have a situation in the lab where your password here does not pass what's in the DNAC. The lab could tell you you can't change it in one place, so you need to know how to change it in both. Uh, other things that possibly could happen, uh, it's not very likely, but they could go in and, and make a modification to the data policy configuration. So if we were to go into the authentication authorization policies and change uh, these settings that I made on day one of every class that I work with, uh, obviously, if I don't have the privilege, then the user of NetAdmin doesn't have the rights to be able to set up all of the configurations that we've been called upon, calling upon the DNAC to do. And you can even see here the number of hits that we've had against these particular uh, command sets and shell profiles. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and exit out of here and um, endpoints. So if I start taking a look at things like network devices and uh, other resources, if I go, let's see. Um, this isn't where I want to be. I wanted to see. Um, network centers. We've got identities. We've got. Components is. I want to see the matrix. All right. So this is the same chart that we have in our class. And when we look at, we've got the idea of SGTs. Let's take a look. I, I wanted to illustrate the fact that we have contractors we have employees in our configs as far as being able to set things up we've got the matrix list here i keep clicking on it and clicking off it because i'm impatient and feel like i'm in the wrong spot but again you can see this is that grid that we were describing but we really don't need to know much about the grid from the perspective of the identity services engine we want to make certain that we know how to interact the grid here. And this is why I'm not seeing it, because I forgot I took it out. I was going to say that's why it's not showing up. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back in here, and I'll go back to employees, to contractors. Let's go ahead and block this. So I'll change the contract. <clears throat> right before class, I accidentally unplugged the, uh, the ice engine. I thought maybe I just crashed it or trashed it a little bit. So let's go back to the identity services engine. And um, refresh. Okay, I, hold up. I didn't hit deploy. Told you I'm bad for it. There we go. So identity services engine, we have employees. And we have, there's employees on the list. And if we scroll all the way up, we can see that employees should intersect with contractors right there. So contractors and employees. So again, I use the DNA center to propagate and to populate this information. Now, if information had already existed inside of here and I had handled the integration, then whatever exists here would be learned by the DNAC, but it might not necessarily involve anything that, D that the DNAC is doing. So again, it's just important to keep in mind that the processes and the mechanisms that we're describing are very important because they give us the ability to be able to uh, affect operations. So SDA rocks one, two, three, and we should get, we are. So if I go back and I disable that, or not disable it, re-enable it, so enable it, I disabled it by changing its mode and we go ahead and hit deploy 
then what should end up happening is, is this guy should immediately start kicking off again. So like I was trying to illustrate here, what we're looking at is we're looking at a mechanism that allows the DNA center to make some significant decisions for us regarding who can talk to whom, how they can talk, and in what circumstances we can allow the flow of information. Now, I went through and I did something as archaic as just blocking an IP address. We could have created an SGACL that would block a port or allow a port to only work in one direction. We could have created very, very complex constructs. But the good news is in the context of the enterprise infrastructure exam, this is not something that we really need to understand because it's not a security focused exam. However, I will warn everyone. And that warning is, is that in the real world, when the rubber hits the road, you're going to be called upon to understand not just the things that you need to know to pass that lab. You're going to be called upon to understand how to deploy things that aren't covered in the lab, how to deal with, you know, uh, more advanced scenarios involving micro segmentation, you know, interacting with um, other solutions like Umbrella or Thousand Eyes. And a lot of these things we don't cover or I have not been covering here because our principal focus has been on the exam. Uh, but I am in the process of once once I get the exam course completely written from the beginning to end, I'm going to uh, blow. I'll probably keep the topologies. I may make some minor changes to the topologies. I want some I want some layer two broadcast functionality in there so we can play around with like first top redundancy protocols and stuff like that. Uh, but what I plan on doing is uh, bumping up to like 20.9, and then uh, I'm going to start recording classes for 20.9, which will obviously go deeper and into a more broader uh, topic domain than the stuff that we know, need to know about for the lab.